Hi there. I wanted to do another video on ChatGPT, kind of follow up with what I learned this week. Um, and I wanted to start with kind of clarifying how ChatGPT's environment is kind of divided right now as far as access to functionality. I'm trying to find, I'm trying to clarify what I've learned about how ChatGPT's functionality is sort of distributed between the free ChatGPT, the paid ChatGPT Plus, and then the ChatGPT developer API. Because um, I find when, even within the OpenAI documentation, it's not as clearly set out some of the key parts. Um, so for instance, uh, ChatGPT is a free website you can go to, log in, especially if you have an OAuth, you can log in through Google or Apple or Microsoft uh, accounts. Um, and then you can use, you have access to ChatGPT version 3.5, I think is what they've defaulted to now on the free version. Um, so that would, you'd see that here if I go to my new chat window. If you're in ChatGPT, you won't have this option to switch between 3.5 and 4, you'll only be using 3. Um, there's no limit on the 3.5 queries. Um, with the paid access, you get access to GPT-4. Um, and with that one, and you can see here in the chat, uh, it has a cap of 25 messages every three hours. So that's that limit is GPT, chat GPT plus. Now, chat GPT plus is a paid service, $20 a month, uh, American, I believe. Um, and it gives you that plus access to this website, the chat.openai.com website. Uh, that, <laughs> and this is where I was getting confused. It does not give you access to the developer API. Uh, although I think they'll give access to the developer API preferentially to paid accounts, but you have to go through a sign up process, uh, I believe. Oh, actually, no. I'm revising this all as I'm thinking. That was what I was thinking, is that you have to get on the wait list for the developer API. I don't think that's true anymore. Uh, and this is just something I figured out yesterday, which is why I was a little confused. Um, I think you actually have developer API access when you get a paid chat GPT plus account, but you have to set up a separate payment process for your developer API account. And so I'm gonna, I'll probably dig more into that in next week. Um, but just if you are a developer and you wanted to use ChatGPT, um, just getting the plus account is not the last step. Just because you can use the ChatGPT plus user interface doesn't mean you can call the API calls uh, using like Postman or your own code. Uh, but like I said, I. I think I discovered late last night when I was kind of poking around that there's a separate billing section within my OpenAI account for the API stuff because uh, so essentially the $20 a month is only through this and it gives you that 25 messages every three hours but that's I've never hit that limit just because I tend to pack a lot of information into my prompts and so I don't have a lot of back and forth um, so I've never even gotten close to 25 messages every three hours usually because I've already got enough information to go off and think and you know it's a there's a whole sort of uh, cyclical process around working with this stuff that I find is slow enough at least for the discovery of me trying to figure out how the stuff works or trying to come up with new ideas and how to use it um, that's perfectly fine but I'm now at the point where I want to start building a website interface to better organize my prompts and also to be able to ac hopefully access the developer API which gives you a lot more fine-grained control over the response data that you get back um, so that's a next step for me and like I said I think I'm okay <laughs> I had been I was starting to feel I was blocked this week because I thought oh I have to sign up for this and I got to wait for them to give me access but like I said last night I think I may have gotten past that but I'll there'll be more in the next week so enough of that for now Another thing that I learned though about uh, ChatGPT is around token limits, so this is also relevant to this. The other thing that's confusing in the documentation, or at least not didn't seem clear to me, 
when I when I've been kind of reading through things is that is how the token limit is applied and and whatnot and so I just started up a chat with uh, ChatGPT to say how many tokens do you support in a conversation. Um, oh, and so here's this is sort of recap what I did in my last video. Um, this is what the question is with un, any other extra prompt filtering. Um, so how many tokens do you support in a conversation? And this is its response. As an AI language model developed by OpenAI. So again, I, last video I talked about how to remove that type of boilerplate language just to keep the token count down, which is important um, when you're trying to work on something. Uh, and again, it says GPT-4 supports conversations up to a total of 4,096 tokens. So 4,096 tokens is roughly four words, but in reality, it's words and word segments. Um, Again, kind of how ChatGPT works is that it takes the entire conversation, passes it through its matrix math, uh, and generates a single token. And then it takes that token, adds it to the result, and then passes that through the matrix math to get another to the next token. And that's basically what it's doing is essentially a whole bunch of mathematical calculations for every single token. And that essentially averages out to roughly 3,000 words, um, which is about 100, page wor 100 words a page, 30 pages worth of dialogue. That it can keep in within the conversation. Once you get beyond that, or even I, I think once you start to approach that, um, ChatGPT's algorithm will start to lose context of some of the parts of the conversation that haven't stayed relevant throughout your conversation. So if I ask about something early on in the conversation, if I don't bring it up again, eventually it's going to filter that out uh, just so that it can sort of keep track of that maximum of 4,096 tokens and still keep generating responses for you. So there's a couple of workarounds for this. Um, one is to uh, just break your tasks into small enough chunks that will easily work within that token limit, uh, and then just have separate conversations for each piece of the conversation. And then you're kind of responsible for managing the overall part. Um, as and now this limit is a technological limit, and it's you know limit as of the present day. Uh, I know that there's a huge amount of active development in these large language models to increase that token uh, count so that you can have larger conversations and keep more information in context uh, within the conversation but and over the next few years you're going to see this change drastically but we're only kind of operating with what I can do right now so uh, as it is right now uh, you, you gotta be selective and how if you want you really Get, make the most out of ChatGPT. Um, you have to be organized in how you approach the problem. Okay, so back to kind of reviewing what I talked about last week. Um, so I have these prompts that I throw in uh, above or in the same prompt as my question, and I get a very different response. So again, the previous one, I get this sort of wordy response. When I get back to this one, it gets rid of the as an AI and, and gives you a different, you know, simpler response here. So again, 4,098 tokens, this limit includes both input and output tokens. A token in English can be as short as one character or as long as one word. If conversation exceeds this limit, it needs to be truncated or otherwise shortened. Uh, and then I ask, can you include a token total in each response you give? Uh, adding an exact token count to each response isn't a feature that the AI natively supports. However, you can manually estimate the token count. English words and punctuation marks typically count as one token each, but this can vary. For example, longer words might count as two tokens, and special characters can also count as individual tokens. Remember that the 4096 token limit includes both your prompts and the AI's responses. Is that limit only per API call, or do tokens add up over a series of calls, I asked. Uh, the token limit is per API call. This means that each individual request to the API, which includes the message input and the model's response, must be within this limit. Tokens do not accumulate over a series of calls. Each API, API call is considered independently uh, with regard to the token limit. So does the length of the conversation affect the outcome of an individual, individual response is my next question. Uh, again, I'm trying to grasp, wrap my head around exactly how this stuff works and it says yes the length of the conversation can influence the outcome of an individual response when processing a prompt the AI model considers the immediate context provided in the conversation however due to the 4096 
token limit per API call, long conversations might need to be truncated or shortened. If a relevant piece of information is removed during this process, the AI might lose track of that information and its responses might not fully align with the earlier parts of the conversation. Uh, so how does the AI choose which parts of a conversation to truncate? Is that something I can specify? As of my knowledge cut off in September 2021, the AI does not automatically truncate or manage the conversation to fit within the token limit. The user or the API caller is responsible for fitting the conversation within the limit. So that's a very important piece. So again, your onus is on you to really manage this. And so if you do notice that key details that it forgets early on as the conversation goes on, you have to reintroduce those and, or remind it, this is important. Please keep this as part of the conversation. Um, and, and again, like I said, these are sort of idiosyncrasies of an early technology. Um, in 10 years, this is going to look very different. Um, but so again, speaking of right now, you have to manage, you have to, you're responsible for uh, a lot of the heavy lifting as far as making sure that the AI stays on top, it gives you good responses. Um, but as long as you're fastidious about your approach and, and meticulous with your wording, um, you will get good quality data uh, and for all sorts of things. Last question was, how can I clearly indicate that I want certain details either thrown out or kept by the AI? Is there a way I should structure my prompts to aid in this process? Uh, again, um, it's it's still mind blowing to me that the, the first step in trying to figure out how to use this as a tool is to ask it directly. How do I use it or can I do this? You know, it, it's, um, it is not normal <laughs> for you know my experience as a as a user of computers, um, but it's it's a, it's a really welcome change to the way that I interface with the computer. Uh, so anyway, again, just to highlight this last bit, uh, to ensure that there are certain details that certain details are kept by the AI or disregarded, you should explicitly state this in your prompts. However, the AI doesn't have a memory like a human, and it processes each input individually within the context of the given conversation. It doesn't remember past prompts or instructions unless they are within the same conversation and under the token limit. So here's a few recommendations. Repetition. If a detail is important, try to repeat or reference it in subsequent prompts. This reinforces the imp information's importance and ensures it stays within the current context. Explicit instructions. You can directly tell the AI to ignore or pay attention to certain details. For example, you can say, uh, ignore the detail about the blue car from previous responses, focus on the red car. Summary. If the conversation is becoming too long, you can provide a brief summary to condense the information. This allows you to keep important details while disregarding relevant ones, irrelevant ones. Um, and I also often ask ChatGPT to do a summary for me. Um, you can ask it to say, hey, summarize what we've done to this point. And you can even say, summarize it into a prompt that I can use as a new conversation. Um, and, get it, and, and when it gives you the response, you can adjust it uh, and tell it to adjust or make changes if you aren't happy with what you get. Um, structuring. Structure your prompt with the most important information or end it with a summary of what you want to re be remembered. The primacy, primacy and re recency effort effects suggest that information presented at the beginning and the end is often remembered best. So that, again, also interesting. So if you start or end, start or end your prompt with the most important information. Direct questions. If you want to focus on a particular detail, ask a direct question about it. Um, excellent set of recommendations. Um, and, and like I said, it's kind of a, you, you kind of have to experiment on your own, um, but great, great, great tool. The last thing I want to highlight in sort of my recap um, is giving you a couple examples of my uh, prompt engineering from the previous video and just kind of comparing what happens if I give a prompt without those versus what I, what I get if I add them into my prompt. So, um, one of the things, I have a property, um, a 10 acre property, like I said here in Ellerslie, I wanted to see, well, what can it give me as far as property management is concerned? It's, it's an undeveloped lot. Um, used to be the old playground in the in Ellerslie, where in the old school, one room schoolhouse was the school. Um, anyway, I haven't, I wanted to give it layout, so okay, give me some options. What, 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 uh, give me uh, options and help me manage the property going forward. And without my sort of pre-prompts where I just get the, the sort of the canned AI responses, it gave me a really interesting sort of talks about, you know, you want to consider environmental impact, community impact, 
what do the regulations say? What's the financial viability? You know, and then hey, here's some options. I could let it develop into a forest. I could convert it into a local amenity, uh, do residential development, other uses. So the canned response without my pre-prompts gives me something that's very human readable, but it's also kind of very focused on me and what I want from it. Um, when I add in my provide information in a direct formal style, ask for clarification, if I need, if I'm missing details, organize what I'm missing and use pre-existing models, again, sort of trying to get it to take the initiative and, and, and to raise issues that it thinks I might want to be talking about. Uh, and then the rest of the prompt is exactly the same. But you'll notice that the difference here is quite drastic, right? So here, this is kind of responding directly to what's inside of my prompt. Um, and again, just kind of not really getting to the actual details and not really necessarily showing me what details I'm, I'm missing. So here, uh, to form a comprehensive property management plan, additional details are required. So now it doesn't give me much as far as what it thinks I could do. Instead, it's giving me questions of, okay, so local reg regulations, restrictions, what's the zoning, what are the local codes, what type of permits are required for environmental conditions, soil and type and quality, wildlife, water quality, flood risk, forest development, financial considerations, budget, potential revenue, property taxes, community input, neighborhood preferences, community needs. So again, I'm definitely finding I'm when I'm digging into a, an issue, I'll con I'll get it. I'll try and prompt it in a couple different ways. I'll like using the the a very detailed prompt using the sort of canned response gives me something that's you know again kind of uh, laying out the overall the overall structure or the idea the, you know the project details, but not sort of honing in on specifics or or, or trying to get me to feed it more information uh, necessarily but here you know, like I said getting both with prompt and without prompt gives me more than just doing one or the other so I guess is what I'm trying to say so uh, useful tools these prompt pre-prompt things but again it's it's kind of you experiment uh, sometimes not having these gives you a different result that's also useful and often like I said, the combination is just as useful. Uh, here's another example. So again, um, I'm trying to start up a PEI AI innovators group. Uh, and so I started off with a one, just write a proposal for an innovators group with monthly meetings, with presentations and discussions uh, on AI tools to innovate on the island. And it gave me a nice sort of background and need, objectives, plan of action, outcome, conclusion. Sort of a nice, rough draft kind of document. Um, then I add in all my clarifications and so now I get a lot more detail of asking for what's the purpose of the group, structure of the group, activities, what format, venue, topics, online platform, do you want an online platform, what's sort of membership, benefits of membership, or you know like so it's giving me a lot more detail. Um, I'm, I'm much happier with this response than I am with this. Although again, there's some elements of this that might spark some ideas, sort of get the, it's good in a, especially the, the default prompt is useful for brainstorming or, or sort of trying to, uh, the initial parts of putting together a plan or an idea or a project. Uh, whereas these sort of more detailed, you know, filtering prompts that I've, I've got, um, can get more into the nitty gritty, nitty gritty or, or detail focus. So um, again, uh, great tools, but it, just trying to figure out all the different things that I can do with this tool is is a uh, exercise into its own. Which leads me to the last thing I wanted to uh, talk about in today's video. Okay, so the last thing I wanted to talk about in, in today's video uh, was just to address the questions that I've had from a couple of people since I put out the previous video. Uh, which was seems to be a common question, and this is, I, I guess it makes sense, um, <laughs> if you're not a developer, uh, a lot of people, I, I'm sure, you know, probably the majority of people in Western society anyway right now have heard of ChatGPT. It's made huge amounts of news, uh, especially around people talking about it being used for writing essays or cheating on your homework or, you know, all these sort of... Uh, 
you know, a lot of the news around AI tends to be sort of uh, catastrophic. You know, it's, if it leads, it bleeds kind of headline. So it's tends to be fairly sensationalist. In fact, a lot of the AI coverage that you're seeing in the news right now talks about you know AI as a threat uh, and it becoming smarter than us, which I mean, in the long run, is a potential threat. Uh, but with all the focus on that sort of, it's not coming today or tomorrow or next week or next month or probably next year or maybe this decade. Um, but that's, you know, again, just a guess. Uh, so there is definitely an aspect of this where AI is learning how to write code and learning how to improve itself that will start to feed back on itself to some degree but that said I think there's an important part that which we're missing when we're fear-mongering to the point where AI the focus on AI itself becoming so smart it's smarter than us and becomes a threat to us I'm much more concerned about the human threats of uh, third parties that are interested in pushing their own agenda as opposed to using this technology to benefit humanity in general, that's a far greater threat right now. Um, and in my next video, I think I'll get more into that. Uh, but just as a little aside, um, when you are watching AI news out there, just be careful of the hyperbole. Um, this stuff is incredibly powerful and incredibly game-changing. Um, but there's a lot of work to go before it becomes self, in, you know, conscious uh, and intelligent in the way that we're intelligent. In the meantime, uh, having a tool that can generate human communication and respond to human communication in a natural way is a game changer in its own and it can be used in all sorts of ways. So let's focus on the positive aspect of this. Um, I asked it, give 10 uniquely different examples, and actually I did 50, um, just because I was kind of like, and I wanted to see what it would do, but I asked it for different examples of how I can use ChatGPT to improve productivity. Um, just as so to get, if you're curious, um, I'll highlight a few of these. I'm going to scroll it so you can read this uh, if, and pause it and read the whole thing. I'm not going to go through all 50 that I generated, but I just kind of wanted to highlight um, to give people some, if you are interested in ChatGPT but aren't sure about how it can be used for your purposes, here's 50 ideas that might you might find some of them apply to you. So project management, uh, use it as a tool to manage your project, set reminders, and assist in the organization of tasks. I, I, incredibly useful tool for this sort of stuff. You can, like I said, you have essentially a project manager or developer or a BA uh, uh, or a graphic design expert or you know pick a pick a field that's white collar that requires technical skills and language skills um, and ChatGPT can probably fill some of those tasks fulfill some of those tasks that you need it's not going to replace the entire role like you can't replace an entire professional with ChatGPT but a, ch a professional can use ChatGPT to uh, perform a lot of bulk heavy lifting that um, a professional skill level is required to do, but um, would be particularly manual tasks that you, you're you kind of doing an autopilot. So project management, great great situation. You can ask it to, to just draft up project plans or task descriptions, you know, give it the requisite details and then ask it to sort of flush it out into something that's more human readable or target a specific audience. Take a set of text and say, rewrite this for this type of audience. Um, again, writing aid. You can use to enhance writing, suggesting more refined phrasing, correcting grammar, providing ideas for creative writing. Also useful. You could say, hey, I'm blocked on a story idea. Um, uh, here's my protagonist and they need a struggle or they've, uh, I need to, I need some sort of a, a key story item moment to, to transition. Or maybe I just need a I want to do a story in the fantasy genre. Give me ten different story ideas, rough, rough layouts. Um, again, you're kind of using it as a way to help uh, enhance your own creativity. Just giving it some, uh, getting it to sort of spit out some you know, random ideas can spark some ideas in your own, and then you can sort of 
follow that or maybe even get it to flush out some ideas. Research, um, also useful. Um, although this one in particular is more requisite, it's more useful when you've got ChatGPT with web browsing, which right now, uh, I, I, and this one is actually turned on for web browsing, but you have to be a paid user. Uh, and I don't even think you get it automatically when you buy your account right off the bat, but I did get access to the web browsing and the ChatGPT plugins is the other thing you don't have access to unless you're a paid account user. And again, I didn't have access to both plugins and web browsing until about a month, month and a half after I started paying for my subscription and then it was unlocked for me one weekend. Um, but that said, right now web browsing is still pretty iffy. Uh, I find it fails on its, when it goes out and tries to hit a web page um, fairly frequently, especially if it's not just straight HTML text. Um, it has a particularly high failure rate around PDFs. Uh, so if you try and send it to a PDF document out on the web, it's most likely going to fail. And if the document's way, you know, it, if it's a t PDF document it can read, remember, uh, it's got a 4,096 character limit. So if it's more than 30 pages, um, it's, chances are it's not going to work anyway. Um, but even with less than 30 pages, I've had very few situations where it's actually managed to read a PDF. Uh, in fact, I can't think of an example where that's happened for me personally. But that's again kind of as of June of 2023. Um, I expect over the next few months that's going to greatly change. Um, and the other thing that is definitely going to change, uh, and it is, I don't have access to it yet, but I know that some people do, is the ability to feed it your own document. So the code and what's it called? Code interpreter. So Code Interpreter is another initiative inside of ChatGPT that's getting rolled out. Again, I don't quite have access to it. But um, by default, ChatGPT is not particularly great at math and it's not great at writing code. It can write, it's good at sort of writing a first draft of code, but you have to really pour over the code line by line, making sure that it's not making some weird, you know, sometimes it's not syntactically correct, sometimes it's using a strange library, sometimes it's inconsistent in the libraries that it chooses for the same technology. So there's a lot of a lot of work that still needs to be done on the code side, um, but uh, that's going to be coming as well. Um, let's see, so what else do we have here? Language learning, learning new skills, customer service. Yeah, so customer service is going to be one where this is going to take over. Uh, if you're a customer service worker right now, expect your job to go away, um, and you're going to want to try and find a new job uh, because uh, Already, it's natural human language, um, and it's chat-based right now, but there's technology out there uh, that will allow text to be generated into uh, audio, uh, and you are we're also at the point now where text can be generated not just to audio, but also to a 3D rendered avatar speaking the language, uh, and even it, it'll be able to translate it too. So. Um, what's where we're going to end up in a few years uh, is every customer service representative you're going to talk to is going to be an AI and it's going to be more pleasant and easier to work with than a human um, because they're not going to get emotional they're not going to respond if you're angry they'll be dispassionate but they'll still give you the information if you ask a question they'll give you a response um, that's definitely one of those areas where there's going to be huge shake up. And like I said, I think customer service jobs are going to be completely given over to AI within the next five years. Um, health and well-being. Uh, this is one where you really have to be careful, um, but it can be used for medication instructions, fitness advice, general illness tips. Um, yeah, you could get it to write you out an exercise plan or, or help you manage your food intake or that, you know, you have a nutritionist that you can talk to essentially. Um, proofreading, again, a lot of the document stuff, data analysis, oh, this is one that's going to be huge uh, in the coming future, especially once multimodal prompting becomes the norm. Uh, multimodal just means being able to feed it things other than just text. Right now, ChatGPT's conversation, what it can read and what it can output are text only. Um, 
and they can do some rudimentary formatting like as in within a text response you can put a it can create a table um, or it can do bullet lists or uh, nested bullet lists or I, I, numerical ordering that sort of stuff um, but pretty rudimentary just basically word processing formatting um, what's going to be coming and again this is code interpreters got this as well is it can start to generate images for you or uh, read images or read documents or watch a video um, or generate a video uh, all these sorts of uh, multimedia types of reading and writing are coming to chat GPT and these types of uh, large language models um, and that's going to completely change the way data analysts do their job um, one of the areas where and this isn't just data analysts uh, but anybody who works with uh, it within like Microsoft Office is the perfect example Microsoft Office is a actively building ChatGPT into their entire suite um, and it's going to allow you to do things like take a spreadsheet and generate a uh, 10 minute PowerPoint presentation off the data and it'll do most of the heavy lifting for you and then you'll just have to make tweaks um, or be able to take a Word document and pull out this spreadsheet that's in there and turn it into an Excel file just automatically for you um, and it's those types of document manipulation and going between Word and Excel and Access and you know the different Microsoft Office applications um, and just being able to use you know to ha expose some of the more uh, professional and, 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 and intricate functionality you can do with like word processing or spreadsheet manipulation um, you'll be able to do that through either text prompting or eventually just talking to the computer and saying okay take this column and highlight it and move it over here or take the values from this and add this uh, and then give me a new column like you'll be able to just talk to your document and it'll uh, update it on the fly um, yeah career guidance you can use it as a career counselor travel planning you could talk about places plan itineraries booked accommodations uh, especially with some of the plugins um, there's I know there's like Expedia plugin and uh, maybe Travelocity yeah, there's a number of the travel related that's definitely where some people have been, some of the early plugins that are available for ChatGPT are in that sort of a air space uh, cooking assistance so we can provide recipes explain cooking techniques suggest meal plans and I do this is another one where the multimodal uh, prompting is going to make a big change is you can take a picture of your food once this becomes available again um, and send it to chat GPT and say give me the recipe for this and it'll give you a pretty good best guess at what that recipe how to make that meal um, things like that are just crazy uh, event planning artistic inspiration mental health support again mental health support is one of those things that you got to be you don't want to rely you know without you don't want to be unquestioning about what things ChatGPT gives you when it's stuff that's, uh, you know, critical like mental health support. Um, tutoring you can use as a tutor for different subjects. To explain, uh, provide explanations, or work through problems, or help with homework. Um, again, very useful. Financial planning. Again, I, I'm kind of looking at land use planning. You can use it for as a as a to help understand concepts or compare investment options, develop a personal budget. Um, more document stuff like email drafting. Uh, you can simulate a conversation for negotiations or public speaking events. Um, oh, I do know I've, somebody is using a large language model. I don't know if it's using ChatGPT under the covers or not, but I did see one bit of news in the last week or so was somebody was uh, has built a tool that will listen to your interview in real time and speech to text what the interviewer asks and then give you take that question and then generate a response in relative real time with a within a very you know a couple seconds re delay and <laughs> essentially letting you cheat on your uh, interview uh, so interviewing is going to be have to go through a complete rethink over the next few over the next year or two but uh, like I said interesting there's good and bad to a lot of this technology. It's all about how you use it. Um, but yeah, okay. So more yeah, music routine, music learning, fitness routine, legal understanding. Some of these get, start to get duplicated, and I was asking for ten at a time. Science explainer: Can it help explain scientific theories or math problems? You can work through complex math problems or understand mathematical concepts. That one in particular, again, 
if you ask it to do the math for you, there's a good chance it's going to get it wrong. Although once Code Interpreter comes out, it's a lot better with math. Um, but even still, you can get it to talk about the theory or uh, explain the concept behind something, and it should, you know, it'll give you a pretty good response generally. Um, and then what else is here? And the professional networking, uh, business strategy, philosophical discussion. Now this is one that I've used, philosophical discussions, uh, especially when I start talking to ChatGPT chat about ChatGPT, both what it can do and what it understands about its, what it can do, that sort of stuff, but um, yeah. Uh, poetry and lyrics, document formatting, reading comprehension, like you said, lots of, lots of different ideas. Um, just if you are kind of curious about this, but you're, again, you don't really know what to do, um, there's 50 ideas for you. Uh, again, I just kind of highlighted a few of them, but feel free to pause. I've, you should be able to see all this. Um, and maybe I'll do one last pan up. Just so you want to see the full list there. Anyway, I think that's it for today. Uh, but I'll get this edited and posted in the next couple of days. And then I'll be back next week with the uh, follow-up of what I've learned using ChatGPT for the week. Okay, talk to you then. Bye-bye.